Welcome to The Sword and the Trial, a podcast of Founders Ministries. Founders Ministries exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of churches. I'm Jared Longshore. And I'm Tom Askell. Thanks for listening to The Sword and the Trial today. And a very special thank you to our FAM members, that is our Founders Alliance membership. Uh, those of you who support us monthly, we're so grateful for your support. We take that very seriously and hope that you are edified by the content that you get and knowing that you are joining with us as we build and as we communicate the truth and hopefully see the reformation of churches. Uh, just a reminder about that there's three different levels that you can come into as a fam member there's the trowel and then there's the shield and then there's the sword right. and i think that's a ten dollar a 25 dollar and a 50 dollar a month um, membership subscription and if you come in at the 50 dollar a month level you actually get a free book every month every so month. founders has been publishing books for a long time many by dr nettles who's our guest today and you get a free book every month there you get other content we have the armory and uh, that's an online portal. It's got all kinds of extra content that you can only get there in the armory. Uh, we have a number of the By What Standard full interviews mm -hmm. there. And so hopefully you're edified by that. Thank you again for your support. Yeah, as we said, we do have Dr. Nettles with us uh, this morning on the show. Uh, uh, Tom, thanks so much for your willingness to come and talk with us again. You've been on this program before. And um, I had Tom as a professor of history at Southwestern Seminary back in the 79, 80s of the last century. You've had Dr. Nettles in this century at Southern Seminary. I did. Not only did I have Dr. Nettles as a professor, but he was so kind to invite me to his house and to have some dinner with his wife, Margaret, and I brought another of my friends, Eric. I remember Eric Smith, Dr. Nettles. And as oh, we're, yes, as I we're, remember. Yes, as we're sitting I call him Redheaded Eric. Redheaded Eric. He is. He's like the sweetest Christian I know. Um, and we, we were having dinner with Dr. Nettles, and he started singing that hymn. Um, he was saying that match this, match this grace of Jesus <laughs> deeper than the high and rolling sea. And he was talking about somebody and he said, you know, somebody thinks that it sounds like a rumbling circus. And he's like, I don't think it sounds like a rumbling circus. Do you, Margaret? And she's like, no. And then Dr. Nellis just kept singing this thing out. It was like the most <laughs> joyful, wonderful dinner ever. Yeah. That's one. That's a that's a great opportunity. We've uh, we've experienced some of that. I'm, one of my kids' most uh, vivid memories of Dr. Nettles is him sitting on the floor in our home and uh, telling the story of uh, Brer Rabbit and uh, not wanting to be thrown into the briar bush. And then that was quickly followed, I think, by maybe a time of, of family worship and Pilgrim's Progress or something, but it turned serious, and it was just really a wonderful, momentous occasion in the life of one of my children and uh, memorable for all of them. We got a number of books by Dr. Nettles. Big stack over there. Yeah, we do. These are books that Founders handles that Dr. Nettles has written or have been written about him. And I'll go with the one that's been written about him. This is a fest shrift that was written a few years ago in honor of Tom. It's ministry by his grace and for his glory. And these are essays on subjects that uh, have been highlighted in the life and ministry of Dr. Nettles. And of course, the title riffs off of what I think is his most impactful book. He's written several, but this one, By His Grace, For His Glory, a historical theological practical study of the doctrines of grace and Baptist life. If you want to understand uh, a historical theological perspective on Baptist, this is the book. And so if you are a Baptist, this is a book you ought to read to just kind of get uh, uh, that understanding beneath your feet. If you want to know about Baptist, this is great. So he's got others as well, a uh, book on preaching, um, book on catechisms, there, but all of them, all the books that we have by Dr. Nettles or about Dr. Nettles are going to be on sale for 35% off over the next week. So if you go to founders.org, go to the uh, bookstore, you'll see these titles are being discounted for the next week. So I encourage you to get a copy of them. There's quite a connection between By His Grace and For His Glory. And then this book that we have just recently published called Still Confessing, an Exposition of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 by Daniel Scheiderer. Um, By His Grace and For His Glory. If, you, if you're a Baptist and you're Reformed and you've ever felt like people said, well, you don't you know, have a place at the table here because Baptists aren't really Reformed, Dr. Nettle's book By His Grace and For His Glory will re really put an end to that. He goes and cites a number of historical Baptists and demonstrates through their own own teaching um, that the sovereign grace of God was uh, proclaimed by Baptist throughout our history. And then, uh, you know, if you come all the way from the 1689 confession, that confession that was so central to the forming of the Southern Baptist Convention, to the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, uh, admittedly, the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 is not the 1689 confession. 
slap me. Just I, so I'm you know surprised. that. Um, but, but Daniel does a good job here of actually expositing that Baptist faith in Message 2000 and showing some of the truths that are therein. And so uh, even as a present controversy we're having about women pastors in the mm-hmm. SBC, there are women pastors in the SBC, and yet our confession has something to say about that. If you are an SBC church, what you should know is that you, you do have to be in uh, general agreement with the Baptist faith in Message 2000. So sometimes there's talk about Baptists or we only know creed but Christ kind of people will know we are confessional people. Even our cooperation in the SBC uh, is confessional, Mm -hmm. according to the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. So this is a great book. Every Southern Baptist should get this book. I mean, if you're I mean, if you're Calvinist, if you're non-Calvinist, you're traditionalist, whatever your your position is, I think know what's in your confession. This is a good resource. Well, uh, Dr. Nettles, you have taught church history, Baptist history for how many years? Oh, goodness. Uh, 44 years now. 44 years. That's incredible. And to give yourself... started in January of 1976 when I first started teaching at Southwestern. Wow. So, I mean, you, you've given yourself to a discipline uh, over the, um, the large majority of your lifetime and, and over uh, what will be more than the lifetime of many of the folks that listen to this conversation. And so you, you obviously have developed a theology, a philosophy of history. And uh, I don't know if you did that before you started teaching or if that uh, happened as you were teaching. I'm sure it's been refined. In fact, I know you and I have talked how some of those points have been refined. But could you give us, say, just an overview in a couple of minutes of your theology and philosophy of history? Sure. Yeah, well, of course, the Christian has a philosophy of history that's different from other secular philosophers. There's very little that they have that they can point to that gives them an objective way in which to evaluate history and the events of history. Uh, there have been all kinds of attempts through the years to do that. You know, you can go to a Hegelian understanding of the synthesis, trying to history trying to come out with some value, and then that's changed, and Marx takes it and says, well, the value is material things, and all of this works in a dialectical way. But a Christian view of history basically is that God has created the world for his own glory. He controls all the events. He works through them uh, in order to bring history to a particular end. We have a linear view of history because we believe it actually starts at, at creation and ends with the coming of Christ, the history of this world. And of course, we have an eternal history, as it were, following with the, with the Lord, those who are his redeemed. But one of the most influential things that I have read on that, which sort of confirmed my understanding, is a, is a book actually by Jonathan Edwards called The End for Which God Created mm-hmm. the World. Uh, and that is a tremendous theological statement about why the world was created and why God saw it as a good thing for the manifestation of every facet of his eternal character. And so that, I think, has sort of solidified things that I was working on through the years. Uh, one of the first, the first lecture I ever gave, I just sweat green paint trying to get my first lecture together when I started <laughs> teaching, and sometimes I was maybe five minutes ahead of the, of the students. Uh, I would give some notes, and then they would uh, write them down, and while they were writing them down, I was trying to figure out what the next thing I was going to say was. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, through 44 years, it kind of developed. But one of the first uh, lectures I ever gave was, Why Study Church History? Hmm. Uh, And uh, I had several points uh, to that, which I may have an opportunity to share some of them during the interview here. But a passage of Scripture that I think uh, actually confirms what Edwards is talking about and that really informs my particular understanding of history is, is Paul's testimony in 2 Timothy where he says um, uh, that he tells Timothy not to be ashamed of the gospel or me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So we have a reality that God has done something before the world began, and this is done in Christ Jesus. And then he says, and has manifest in Christ Jesus, who brought, uh, who, who, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 
of which I was appointed an apostle and a preacher and a teacher of the faith to the Gentiles. Then he goes on to say, and I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep, then the translation, the, the Greek actually says, he is able to keep my deposit until that day. Uh, some have translated, he's able to keep what I have committed to him, my deposit I've given to him. Others, rightly so, I think the ESV translates it this way, he is able to keep that which he has committed to me hmm. until that day. Then he tells Timothy to guard the good deposit that was given to him. seems to me that what Paul is saying is that the revelation that God has given to him of God's purpose in history is something that God himself will protect until that day, that is, until the day Christ comes again. Mm. Now, what is what is the deposit? The deposit is the, the reality, first of all, of God's redemptive plan, the, the existential reality of how God is working moment by moment in history to bring to pass his determination for what how history is going to come about. And the second thing is the revelation that he has given us of that. That's particularly the deposit itself is the actual word, the error-free nature of the word. The content of the deposit is that this is God's world. He has created this world. He controls it by his providence, which is based upon his decrees. He will bring it to an end in his own time for the glory of Christ when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God's Father. So that's what history is. So when I, when I teach church history, what I'm looking for, I, I'm looking for ways in which God's providence actually can be is manifest to such a degree that I can say, look, here is one of those events in which we can see that God is protecting his deposit. Here is an event in which we see the world is attacking his deposit. Hmm. Here are some persons who reaffirmed this deposit and were willing to suffer for it. And so I see history from the time of Adam to the time to the present. I see particularly church history as the story of God protecting the deposit. Dr. So Nellis, when I look at our, I'm sorry, ahead. you go ahead. Do you have something you want to finish there? I was just going to give a few, few examples. That's fine. Well, I was going to ask you, that's such a beautiful picture of the Christian understanding of history. And um, the, one of the reasons we're having this conversation today is because we have a project called Wield the Sword. And this is coming out of the film that we did, By What Standard, and identifying uh, through that process, we said, you know, there's really some areas that we have not been actually taking the Word of God and using it in the world, a number of spheres, and you're addressing history in this project, Wield the Sword. And uh, as we address... Uh, there's different topics like the topic of sexuality that we're going to address the home even government thing a variety of issues um, because we're seeing that there really are some wrong ways that even christians are approaching these different topics so when it comes to history and you think about just if you had a chance i mean you've you've um trained up many, many ministers of the word, and you're looking at the kind of evangelical world, the reformed evangelical world. When it comes to history, uh, is it true that there's there's some things that we are missing and some ways that we need to be thinking about history that are more biblical? Because uh, it seems to me the, the picture you just painted has certain implications. If there is a God and if he does have a purpose in history and if there is uh, an antagonist to that purpose and we're living in the midst of it, then we need to live a certain way. And I'm suspicious that that there are some Christians that are maybe not thinking about that as robustly as they ought and can really benefit from what you've said. But is that the way that you're seeing it? And if so, can you kind of chart out what it looks like and in, in what ways are certain Christians kind of missing this idea of a Christian understanding of history? Well, let me look at that from the standpoint of how each individual should think about history on the one hand and then what the larger picture might might look like. Uh, one, one of the points that I try to make when I'm talking about presuppositions about the character of history, the very first one I have is is, uh, is the entire historical process is meaningful. And I refer to, refer to Romans 8, verses uh, 18 through 30, in that, in which uh, Paul sets forth 
uh, the, the reality, the Spirit's yearning for us, and of Christ's death, and of God's predestining purpose, and that he goes on to say that he, he works all things, uh, that uh, all things work together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. This fits into the whole, the, the larger purpose, as we talked about, that God is conforming a people to himself according to the gospel to the glory of his Son. And so the Christian, from a standpoint of being obedient to Scripture, uh, does not have to uh, look at history and think that God is making mistakes. He doesn't have to look at the individual things that happen in his life and think that somehow God has forgotten him or that this is not really God's will for him. Uh, he can look at all of these things and realize that uh, even through tragic events or even through personal mistakes that we make, uh, that God will use them in such a way as finally to mold us according to the image of the Son, because that is God's purpose in history. God is not going to fail his purpose in history, and that means that at every particular point along the way, every individual who is living within history, God is going to work his purpose. Like Ephesians says, he works all things after the counsel of his own will. So while there's a, another biblical doctrine of human responsibility that we take very seriously and we must repent of our sins and realize that we make mistakes, we don't blame God for our mistakes, but we realize that his providence and his wisdom transcends all of those things uh, so that what he brings into our lives he will use for his glory and he will use to transform us. So if, if the individual Christian has a a healthy, or the word, uh, great word you used, a robust view, robust Christian view of what history is, he will see his own life as within that process and will not despair at the various events that uh, God brings into his life. So, Tom, uh, that's a wonderful uh, way for Christians to think individually, and, and we are called to do that because God's always working in the midst of our lives. And if we can keep that in mind, then when our dreams don't come true, when our plans are countered and we find ourselves uh, on a pathway that we never would have chosen, we can be comforted by all of that truth that comes right out of the Bible. But, but if we could back up a little bit or maybe enlarge that, I mean, that's true over the broad sweep of the world as well, isn't it? So it helps us to, uh, to frame the way we would think about something like World War II or uh, something even beginning before, go back to the fall, uh, the very fall of Adam into sin needs to be in this frame of what God tells us he's doing. And so I think about uh, things that tend to make us nervous. As we're going through them, we're looking at the landscape, we're saying, oh, no, you know, it looks like these bad things are happening or this division is happening in this group or this controversy has erupted. And when we look back at history and study things that have happened, okay, we see some of the ways that God was ruling and overruling. But when we're going through it, we can't see all of the ways that God is working this together for our good and yeah. for his glory. But we right. know it's true. Yes. Yeah. So, so how do you? What would you say to us as we're trying to to navigate here in the early part of the twenty first century um, life as evangelical Christians in the West? And it seems like, man, you know, maybe there's some cracks in the foundation, or a lot of questions about things, uncertainty. What what counsel can you give to us in light of what we know and how we should be thinking about history? You know, the, the, one of the books of the Bible that that seems to deal with that in, in the very specific way in which you placed it is the book of Habakkuk, mm. where Habakkuk is looking around him in Israel, and he sees all the unrighteousness that's in Israel, and he's wondering what in the world is going on, how is, how is God going to deal with this? Then God talks to him and says, well, I'm, I'm working. Uh, there's, a, there's a country that's become very strong. They're the Babylonians. They're idolaters, and they worship their own strength, and they, they worship all that they uh, they think that they do all these things. Well, I'm going to bring the Babylonians on to Israel to punish them. And then Habakkuk gets very upset about that and says, Oh, Lord, you're, you're purized and to behold evil. Aren't you holy? And so forth. And uh, he, he really rejects that whole idea that God could possibly use this pagan nation to come and, and punish those that are, act that are more righteous than they. He stations himself to see what God will do, and he says, Well, yeah, I know all those things about Babylon. I'm going to punish them, too. Uh, and so 
uh, Habakkuk is just totally flummoxed by all this. He doesn't understand how these big pictures of what God is doing in history and how he can punish one group with a group more evil, and then he'll come back and hold them responsible for being his instruments in punishing the first group. They are his instruments, and yet God holds them responsible. And so he just says, well, I've just got to live by faith. And then, of course, Habakkuk is the, is the book from which uh, Paul and the book of Hebrews draw the statement, the just shall live by faith. Uh, and and that, that specific statement that relates uh, in their application to justification by faith to the particular application of Christ's righteousness to us is derived out of this tremendously sweeping view of God's providence in history and how the person who is observing it just has to believe that God is doing the right thing, that he is doing what he wants to do. And so Habakkuk finally says, you know, though, even though there are not any figs on the vine or there are no cattle in the stall, still I will believe what the Lord says. Mm-hmm. Back so, to that. so those are the kinds of things in which we say, I cannot explain all of this right now. I cannot explain the Holocaust. Uh, maybe in general terms, we can say these are the kinds of things that are prophesied, but I cannot explain how one evil man like Hitler can actually get it in his mind to to involve himself in that kind of genocide. And I cannot understand how someone like Stalin can be even more cruel mm. within the context of his own people, and I can say that God's providence controls these things. How in the world can a historian, can a Christian look at any of those things while we see them as evil and want to condemn them as evil, and yet at the same time say, but God's providence is working out all of this? That is something where we simply have to affirm it by faith. So we we operate on the basis of revealed truth. We operate in our lives on the basis of what God tells us to do. Where error is present, we have to be willing to seek to confront it. We have to be willing to try to set it right, uh, even though we, we may think that we're going to lose. But we still have to be willing to do that, realizing that God has larger purposes. Uh, you, but the fact that, Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Hearing you talk I about this. I get on a run. I just can't stop. You're just rolling. You're rolling. you got a nice rhythm, too. I don't know. I'm not sure if you're finishing the sentence or not, so I don't mean to jump the... Uh, that was a comma, not a period, but... Uh, the, hearing you talk about this is getting me so excited about uh, the Wield the Sword project and hearing you address history because you, I think you referenced kind of the Hegelian dialectic of history before, and it's becoming so clear to me that those are two contradictory understandings of history that lead to radically different ways of operating in the world. If there is no yes. creator yeah. with no purpose and no providence, then really I'm free to really be as pragmatic as I want because the story is ultimately about me. Um, I'm going to live. You only live once. Here it is. And let me do what I can to kind of climb the totem pole and do what I need to do. And I become the center of that story. But the Christian view is it's so humbling in all of the right ways. It's like, well, God has a purpose and I don't know, you know, I'm not the center of this story. I, I don't know if I'll even be a character that makes it in the book. I'm just a kind of a, a person to be faithful in the position that God has given me. As you spoke about that, um, I, I, somebody spoke about how some of the older um, great stories, just books you'd read your children about conquest, the main character um, was not all that impressive, what was impressive is the awesome journey that he was on, you know, almost parallels to John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, but now kind of some of our modern stories, it's like the hero, the, the center of the story, the person that you're thinking about being always has to be this awesome person with all of these superpowers, you know, but that that's a dangerous way of thinking about living in the world and thinking that really history is going to terminate on you and how much you can collect and how much fame you can get, how much influence you can have uh, rather than this other story that says, no, I don't know what's going to happen in my own experience here in my own nation or in my own uh, situation, but I know that God is actually doing something, working all things for my good. And he's going to bring himself glory and he's going to bring Christ glory. And that will help me to be faithful and really to sacrifice, to do what I need to do um, when, when the situation presents itself. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that is precisely the right application 
Uh, we, we, we have these grandiose views of Scripture, hopefully guided by Revelation. And then it leads us into an understanding that there may not be a specific prescription for every particular problem that, that comes up, but it is, a, it is a consent to the truthfulness of God's revelation, that He is wiser than we are, that He is doing what He wants to do, and that He has revealed to us, sometimes in specific propositions, sometimes by basic principles that we need to think about and work out into our lives, and that's the process of Christian maturity, but that we see ourselves as stewards of our moment. We see ourselves as stewards of what we should do without necessarily any promise that we're going to win. Uh, it is it is a matter of being faithful. I was reading through Second Timothy uh, chapter 4 yesterday and just thinking about all that Paul had been through and how um, he was abandoned by friends during one part of his trial, but the Lord stood by him, and when he was delivered from the lion's mouth. I, I think that that's what Paul, what Paul was talking about there is, that during the first trial that he had when he went to Rome, he was delivered. He was not executed then, and I think that probably he went to Spain. There's witness in some of the early writings that Paul did go to Spain. But then he comes back, and he's visiting the church at Rome, and that's when Nero gets so upset about what he's, his being blamed for the burnings, and so he's blaming it on Christians. Paul is there. He, in order continuing to divert attention from himself, he puts Paul on trial, and that's the point at which uh, he is then beheaded. And Paul knows that that's coming. He says, the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. Henceforth is laid up to me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award not only to me, but also to all who love his appearing. Uh, and he said that God will, he will deliver me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Well, I think that, that that passage indicates that once he has been delivered from death, and he says this, this happened in order that the Gentiles might hear. I mean, that's, a, that's, very, that's a really intriguing <clears throat> statement that Paul makes there, that the Gentiles might hear. What does he mean by that? Well, I think it means that first trial when no one came to my defense, the Lord stood by me, he delivered me from the lion's mouth, I went to Spain, I spoke into a completely uh, unevangelized area, I came back to be with the church in Rome, I'm arrested again, and now I'm about to be killed. But the Lord will deliver me safely, even though it means beheading. Uh, so, interpreting our lives in light of the overall purpose of God and what He wants to do, uh, is is the is uh, is at least one of the important aspects of having a Christian view of history. Mm. God will not waste our lives. God will not waste uh, the gifts He has given us, the experience He's given us, the task to which He's called us. We seek to learn to be as faithful as we can in every situation, and then finally, when our time is over and he delivers us up, we can know that he's <coughs> excuse me, delivering us safely to his heavenly kingdom. Yeah, and, Tom, uh, Tom, that's so good. And, and, and it does come back to the, the whole center point of history, doesn't it? I mean, the, the crucifixion of Jesus. I mean, he's our Lord. He's our master, and he was slaughtered on a cross to fulfill God's purposes for this world and for his people. So, you know, if that most tragic and in one sense unrighteous event in all of human history was the point at which God was doing his deepest work, then surely we can believe in our own lives, in our own times, when things are unjust, when we are not uh, treated righteously or whenever our desires are not fulfilled, that God could be at work in that as well. Amen. You know that is that is the model of God's historical work that can never be surpassed. Amen. Peter said, "Him, He was delivered up to you by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, and you have taken Him and by wicked hands have crucified Him." Hmm. The we, you, Jews that rejected Him were involved. The Roman Empire and its worship of, of power was involved. Uh, they're responsible for it, but he was delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. There, there is no greater 
condensation of the reality of both human responsibility and God's absolute sovereignty in history than that particular event. Mm. That, uh, that's just hard for us sometimes to continually, as Jesus said, take up our cross and follow him. Amen. I think that's part of what he meant. Take up your cross and follow me. I'm going to the cross because God has determined it for me. I'm going to the cross because I know that is why I came into this world, to give my life a ransom for many. And if you are going to follow me, you have to be willing to realize that God has determined your life to be fit for his glory in the same way, and you must pursue it, even if it means an end to your temporal existence like mine. If we can try to bring this to... I'm. I'm thinking about what you charted out here about a Christian understanding of history to some of our um, present circumstances and um, especially related to winning. So as soon as you start talking about history and God's providence in it, the Christian says, well, if I'm faithful, there's really nothing else to do but win. So if I'm, if I'm found faithful, I'm going to win because God is sovereign and he's going to accomplish his purposes. But the the tension comes in is i think how some people think about winning so we've got to have a theology of history that acknowledges you might have you might end up with a very large institutions and a very um large amount of wealth and a number of accolades and you and win you could end up with all that and win but you could also end up with no institutions, um, no wealth, and no accolades, and win. So you can win in either way uh, by being faithful. And you can end up in both of those situations, um, having the institutions and the accolades and the wealth, and not win. And you can end up without all of those things and not win. And so I'm even thinking about Southern Baptist life. I mean, it's a massive denomination with massive influence in America. And that is not an inherently bad thing, um, but it's not an inherently good thing either when you think about the way history is unfolding. And um, what you said, Dr. Nello, shines light on that to me. Of what, what's it going to look like to be faithful uh, in the 21st century, in the, over the next 30 years, um, what do we do that we have all of this influence? And I can feel a temptation even in my own heart to say, well, let, let's operate in a certain way so that we can keep the influence, we can keep the White House access, uh, we can keep um, the large megaphone that we have, we can keep the large institutions that we have, um, but I fear that there's certain moves that could be made that aren't operating with this full orbed understanding of Christian history and what it means that uh, very often it's by sacrificing ourselves, taking another hill that we see the kingdom of God advance in the world. Does any of that make sense? Is there a way you can bring it down and kind of speak to that level? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you've stated it very well and you've used a, uh, a very um, a gripping visual analogy of, of as to how these things operate uh, frequently. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being victorious even in a world descent for a, a period of time. There were certain promises made to Israel that had to do with the covenant that God had with them that clearly waited, re related to worldly wealth and worldly position and all of their enemies being put under them. Uh, all of it, though, was a particular part of a covenantal relationship that was supposed to <laughs> lead them to, to see that they could never keep their part of the covenant, that there would always be a decline, and they would always make themselves susceptible uh, to judgment. Uh, but there may be brief periods where the righteousness of one person or one nation lifts them up, even in the world, above others. But that's, that's not to be considered, as you pointed out, the final victory. Final victory always is obedience to, to Christ and obedience to the Word of God. And so it may be that people are beat down and people are seem to be losers, like the Apostle Paul did before he was beheaded. I mean, he seems to be a loser. Uh, but he wasn't. I mean, this this is he was faithful to the end, and there was going to be the crown of righteousness. This is the reason that the gospel, <clears throat> so many times the gospel is mentioned, The one of the elements that is set forth is that we have the hope of glory. He that holds this hope in him, as John says, purifies himself, even as he himself is pure. 
So if we have the long-term look at what it means to win, that is to be conformed to Christ in the end, then that is going to be our focus. It's not going to be a worldly focus as to how much power I can gain and how many uh, people that I can commend myself to as being uh, worthy of of their respect. Uh, Those are all subfinal things. That which should drive us is that we want to see Christ in his glory. We want to be like him. And so if we have this hope in us, uh, we will purify ourselves even as he himself is pure. So that means in personal devotion, in personal confession of sin, in personal pursuit of righteousness, in having our mind trained to believe the truth of God, to work for the truth of God, uh, to seek to conform all things to his image, particularly uh, in our churches and in our lives. It seems to me that that should begin with the, <clears throat> the reality that we are, we are founded to proclaim the gospel. That, that anything that detracts us from proclaiming the gospel uh, has to be amended in some way. Yeah. We are called on. To, we are called on to to argue for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, and to warn against those worldviews that will detract from the faith once delivered to the saints. I was talking with <clears throat> today, well, with uh, with Margaret about. This, this, all of these things that are involved. There's, there's, there's evangelism, and there's missions, and there's, there's purity, but there's also these consistent warnings about, the, oh, beware of Alexander the coppersmith. He did me much harm. He opposed our message. The Lord will reward him according to his deeds. Uh, false teachers will come in, and they will, all of these things. And so there, there are all these warnings. It's, 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 not, it's not a life for sissies at all. And so to maintain the of what we think are the most important things and make them the most important things and let everything serve that while we, <clears throat> at the same time, protect the foundation, the, the underlay of those things, because if we forget those other elements, then eventually the most important thing will be destroyed also. Mm-hmm. So, so I think that's a... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah Tom, so I mean, this, I mean, this view of life and history, it also I mean, has embedded within it a view of the end and, and that's been revealed to us in Scripture. And so because we know that, uh, it's fair to say, isn't it, that we don't have to worry about forcing things to work out. Right. We have a rule book. We have a guide. Right. We have Scripture. And you know, I've been struck with uh, Hebrews 11 where it talks about by faith, what these great accomplishments. By faith, the Red Sea parted. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Uh, by faith, you know, armies were conquered. And it says, and by faith, some were sawn in two and thrown to wild beasts and you know, drowned. I mean, it's the same faith, same faithfulness, living in dependence upon the Creator who's redeemed them through the Son that enabled them to uh, cross over the Red Sea on dry ground and to be eaten by wild beasts. It's the same faith, yeah. and God's the one who decides which role we play in this bigger picture. Yeah, that, that, those couple of verses in there would be better if they'd been left out, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you <laughs> by faith. Sawn in two. I have looked at that and thought, man, what would that be like? Yeah, Goodness. by faith, by faith. I think mm-hmm. I have fears? Huh. <laughs> yeah. It makes me think of the uh, wield wield the sword, the project. You know, if you have a, and when it comes to history, you mentioned uh, uh, the Hegelian dialectic. I, don't, I think you might have referenced Marx as well, Doctor Nettles. So if you set up two characters, you know, two men, one's a Christian and he's wielding the sword when it comes to history, and the other is a Marxist and he's wielding the sword when it comes to history. You know, so here's the here's the great conflict. Well. Those two men are doing radically different things. They most they both are there with swords, and they're both they're both hoping and laboring for a certain future. You know, they want history to go a certain way in the days to come. But the Marxist is doing that, just as Tom you said, he's doing it, it just in in fear. He's doing it with a will to power. If I don't bring this about somehow, then it's not going to get done. It's not going to be brought about. And so I'm forced over into pragmatism, and I'm going to start to operate by any means necessary to see what I want uh, to see brought about in the world. But the Christian, as you've laid out, Dr. Nell, is doing something totally different. There's a creator. He is sovereign. 
Uh, and yet I'm still to wield the sword. I'm still to stand here and to fight for his truth, to see his kingdom advance in the world. But I'm not doing that the way the Marxist is. I'm not doing that um, entirely dependent upon my own power and my own desire. I'm doing that trusting God, and I'm doing that in a way that is regulated by his word. And that's fascinating to me because there's so many people that want to say, well, you're doing the exact same thing that, that the, uh, the Marxist is and trying to see the ways of God made known on earth. But, boy, those are two entirely different operations. Well, the Marxist doesn't have any absolutes along the way. The Marxist has a final goal that he's working toward. And so, as you said, he becomes pragmatic. He just kind of figures out how he can reach that goal. And if his goal is if he's a, di- a true dialectical materialist, he believes that the, that the goal of history, which is not, has, has not been realized yet, but the goal of history is that every single person will have the same uh, material good, so to speak. They will be in the same boat, having the same power, same material goods, that's what the world is. There's no spiritual dimension to it. Uh, we're all here by accident, but we need to try to conform to the basic way in which history is moving, and that is to create that. But we don't have absolutes along the way. So anything we can do to create that classless society, uh, and that society in which everyone has the same power, everyone has the same possessions, uh, is that it's okay to do that. So if there are people that stand in the way that will not bend, it's okay to get rid of them. And so so Marxism in its rawest form was revolutionary and murderous uh, because everyone who opposed it philosophically or even practically, you just have to get rid of them uh, in order to uh, achieve the goal you have of the classless society. Uh, there are other applications of Marxism, <laughs> of course, in that uh, you, you have the idea that history or or whatever is controlling history finally will synthesize into the uh, shared power in a different way. But you don't do it by killing people. It, it was seen that that never worked. Uh, and so you figure out a way to in, uh, to uh, invest your uh, sense of how you can control the outcomes of history. You insert them into existing institutions. You seek to use those institutions and conform them to your philosophical viewpoint to achieve your outcome. And so there are are really no rules along the way, no absolutes that govern you along the way. It's just that you have got to work toward this, this outcome. The Christian, though, has rules along the way. He has propositions that are binding upon him. He has a an overall uh, outcome of the glory of God that is to be accomplished through the insertion of, of truth and the insertion of the gospel into the world. And if it means personal suffering and sacrifice, that's fine. But there are absolute standards that govern our conduct along the way. It is not that just we think we can manipulate the outcome. We trust that God will do that. Uh, And the way he will do it is through the obedience of his people all along the way to the absolute revelation of how we are to conduct ourselves and how we are to think. So I think just in a broad scale, that is the difference between having a philosophy of, of history in which the outcome controls everything and and uh, and exempt us from having absolutes along the way, and then a world a, a view of history that sees that God will control this, but what He requires of us in the meantime is a conformity to and an obedience to the absolutes that He has revealed to us, whether they be propositions of, of truth or whether they be uh, a guidance for personal living. Mm. Amen. I wish we had time to talk about this, Dr. Nels. Maybe we can have you on again to talk about um, how both of those worlds were kind of operating in the conservative resurgence. I, I've heard before that sometimes there was a really good cause, but there was language like, well, for the cause, we need to do this. For the cause, we need to do this. And in some ways, it became uh, by any means necessary, and the the means used were not as tethered to the Word of God as they ought to have been. And then I've been wondering about that and then the relationship to even some of our present controversies. But I guess that has to be a teaser because we've run out of time. So we can have you on again to talk about that. Dr. 
Dr. Nettles, it's been so wonderful to uh, have you here and to hear a little teaser about what's coming with Wield the Sword and your analysis of history. So thanks so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Tom.